This episode of the podcast has been brought to you by Sweet Cheetah Publicity. Sweet Cheetah is an inclusive, socially conscious PR collective that puts their money where their mouth is. They have a current roster of bands that reads like a greatest hits anthology. Brainiac, Catholic School, Jawbox, The New Amsterdams, Oceans in the Sky. I mean, the list goes on and on. They also do PR for record labels such as A La Carte, Arctic Rodeo, Steadfast, Rad Girlfriend, and so many more. How do they pay it forward? How do they put their money where their mouth is? By generating thousands of dollars in annual charitable donations to the likes of Women in Vinyl, Coalition of Communities of Color, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and many, many more. The man has the receipts. I've seen them. It is real. The artists, labels, and podcasts Sweet Cheetah works with are curated with an eye on working primarily with friends. You could find Sweet Cheetah on all of the social media platforms, be it Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Just look for Sweet Cheetah PR and they will be there. He's been Tim. I've been Peter. And Sweet Cheetah has been beautiful. Tonight on the podcast, and what we have expect of us. Tara Van Flower All of, these questions and more will be answered of Lycia. On the book of very, very bad Please enjoy podcast. and forget that your soul is finite. So I want to get into some creepy shit tonight. What do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I think I uh, I think where I'd like to start, I guess, is uh, I know you. I know you. We've talked about some of the weirdness that you've had with like Ouija boards and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But um, it, you you've never seen anything paranormal, ghostly, anything like that, have you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have, um, for sure. It's, I was telling, you know, when I was on Tim's podcast, I, I said that like all this stuff's happening and, and I never really thought anything of it because I just kind of dismissed things. Um, but yeah, I've seen, I mean, I think the most painfully obvious one was when my grandfather died we went down to West Virginia for his funeral and stuff. And we were all sitting around the house. I think it was I was in about like eighth grade, maybe at the time. And my grandfather collected those old oil lamps, the kind that actually had oil in them. And you had to light the wick and everything. So you had a whole bunch of them. And it was kind of that time of night where people hadn't turned the lights on yet, but it was starting to get dark out. And all of a sudden, one of those lamps was lit. And... I'm like, who lit that lamp? Like the way the living room was set up was 
the you know the chairs and stuff were on this side and the shelves and everything were on that side so and i'd been there all day because there was nothing going on so if somebody had lit one it would have been really obvious and nobody had lit it so i'm like asking everybody who lit the lamp who lit the lamp no, nobody's like copying to it and i'm like don't you all find that kind of weird and my brother was like well if it's a ghost it's just grandpa so who cares and i'm just like that's how do you not care that this oil lamp that my grandfather collected <laughs> is suddenly lit and it would take like flame to you know just it was very strange but um that's kind of the most like blatantly like nothing i could do could explain that um i i still i mean i don't have an explanation for it other than it had to have been something spooky because there was there's no other explanation for it well sure i mean it's <clears throat> what they would call uh you know spontaneous pyrokinesis sure you know something just igniting out of nowhere that's that's very rare that's that's in, even even in the paranormal circles that I, i'm somewhat associated with that's something that just doesn't really occur that often so for that to happen that's that's a pretty heavy connection that was going on there with if, yeah. if you believe it was your grandfather i mean that's great well <laughs> i mean there i <laughs> I try to always look for a rational explanation for things. Like I was thinking about this last night when I was taking my walk. Like, I love the idea of magic and like this, these beings that we don't, that are out there in the world that we don't know that we can't see, you know, aliens, Bigfoot, fairies, vampires. Like, I love the idea of all that stuff. And then realistically, like I want it to exist. But then realistically, I'm like, yeah, but we probably live in this very black and white world that none of these things are real and and whatever. But I want everything to be like extra, you know? Sure. And but so whenever weird stuff happens, most of the time I just kind of dismiss it or like think, well, there's probably an explanation for this that I just don't know, which is probably the case 99% of the time. However, in the case of the oil lamp, there was no explanation. Like I said, I was sitting there all day long and it would have been very obvious if somebody had lit that oil lamp and other weird things about my grandfather, like, I mean, this isn't so strange, but I had dreams about him after he died. And the dream that I had about it was that he came and sat with me in this room that was all white and he was dressed in all white. We had a conversation. When I woke up, I don't remember a single thing about the conversation other than the, what the room looked like, what he looked like, whatever. My mom had dreams about my grandfather after he died. And she kept having this reoccurring dream where he kept telling her, you need to get a new car. And she, in the dream, she's like, no, I like my car. And he's like, no, you need to get a new car. Well, after she had these dreams, she was driving blacked out, went over this ravine, landed upside down in the river, came to, climbed out of the car, you know, through her window, up this huge bank with a head injury, all this stuff. So that was odd. And then another thing with my grandfather was when my grandma was kind of in her last stages, of um life every night she said that he came to her through the wall at the exact same time dressed all in white sat beside her never said a word and left at the same time every night and of course my family were all like yeah you know it's just you're you know she's having issues whatever but yeah. i just think it's weird because like all of this stuff kind of surrounding my grandfather and then for his lamp to be you know lit was kind of kind of weird but well, that's anyway that's the most blatant thing that i can think of that's more than kind of weird and secondly <laughs> it's 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 hilarious to me that uh it's your grandfather because 
<clears throat> the only time I've ever had a positive experience with something of the other, it was my grandfather on my mother's side. He passed away when I was 18 or close to it. And every year around the holidays, when I would go to my grandmother's home, I would see him in the mirror in my periphery wow. very, very clearly. And my mother didn't see it, but my grandmother and my aunt also said that around the holidays, they would see him That's in the mirror, it. in the same mirror, in the same living room. Yeah, we saw Papa. He was he was uh, sitting on the couch. That's interesting. And, that, and that's kind of like it. I mean, there's no there's no romantic story behind it. It's just we would all look in this yeah. mirror peripherally and see him sitting there. I don't know if that's just one of those, you know, m memories that are burned into our uh, right. subconsciousses. But still, I I'd like to think that the greatest man I'd ever known was still hanging around after he passed away. That was my favorite you know, grandfather. Yeah. And he was, he, he kind of helped raise me. So I, I felt, comf I felt comforted by that because I, I really loved him. Like he was yeah. the, mo the most genuinely gentle man I'd ever met in my life. I modeled myself after him actually. Yeah. That's sweet. I think so. Anyway. <laughs> like all my other stuff is like kind of, more ethereal i think or ephemeral or whatever i don't like you know things like the electricity acting weird in a room the temperature in the room being colder like my room the temperature was when i was into the occult and stuff the, te the temperature in my room was noticeably colder than the rest of the house and like things would like act weird electricity would act weird in that room sometimes and like you know, I'd be laying on the bed and I would have my back kind of to the room and I would feel the bed go down like somebody got in mm -hmm. and I would assume it would was like a friend or whatever who was staying with me and it wouldn't like nobody would be there or like I would wake up with like weird scratch marks in spots that like I wouldn't scratch in my sleep and, um, you know, kind of feel stuff touch you and things like that and um you know you could sort of explain all of that away with well your room just has a you know your room's just colder the electricity is wonky in that room your imagination so i never put like a whole lot of stock in it i guess um and that's kind of what i do with everything it's kind of like oh there's probably an explanation for it and i just don't know you know well, I mean, <clears throat> I had one thing explained to me that makes sense on the rationalist end of the spectrum, where if you grew up in a home with knob and tube, knob and tube wiring, which is just, you know, it's the oldest style electricity that there is. Mm -hmm. it, it was the first style. Um, it creates a very, very incredible uh, electromagnetic field, which makes human beings hallucinate, nauseous. Mm. Uh feel certain things and uh, that's plausible but it just so happened that that house i'd grown up in we took the knob and tube out yeah my house definitely didn't have that because my house wasn't old enough to have that yeah that that would have uh most of the time they eliminate a majority of that uh probably around the 60s or 70s yeah yeah you know what i mean um but I personally updated the electricity with my father when I was 13 years old. So I know it was gone and yeah. things, things were strange when we got in there and started working, but it didn't really get fucked up until we'd torn the walls out, gutted everything, insulated, put up drywall, painted, did that whole deal, <clears throat> completely changed the home. And then yeah. it, it went ape shit. You know what I mean? Well, that's what they say, like, a, on a lot of those, like, ghost adventures and stuff like that. Like, a lot of times when people do renovations on a house, it kind of stirs up the energy in the house, you know, because it's been the same for so long. And maybe whoever's hanging around is, like, pissed off that you're changing things up or, you know, or whatever. But, yeah, you know, it's funny because my house that I grew up in, 
I always had the creeps in it my whole life. And that's really the only place I remember because we grew up. I mean, I have vague recollections. We lived in a mobile home before we moved in there. And I have vague recollections. Like I can picture what the bathtub looked like and sitting on the swing outside and stuff. But like I lived my whole life in this house and I was scared of it my whole that I could as far back as I can remember. And like stuff would happen where like I can distinctly remember one time it was like in the middle of the night or whatever. And I heard somebody in the cupboards in the kitchen. And first of all, the house is very small too. So it wasn't like some vast, you know, you could hear somebody on the other side of the house very easily. Yeah. And I heard somebody in the cupboards and I thought my dad was up. So I got up for whatever reason and there was nobody there. And so I remember that and I can remember like laying in bed awake and staring at my door and watching it kind of like just barely move, you know, mm. and stuff like that. And I mean, a lot of that can be chalked up to imagination or something settling in the cupboard or whatever. But nevertheless, it happened. And I mean, I, I have no explanation for why you would feel scared of your own house when that's all you kind of knew and you know like who knows like maybe some weird crap went down in there before we moved in or something but well there is always a, there. there's something really really interesting about ohio at large and that is uh ohio had the most amount of american indian fashion mounds mm. and earthworks as they call them which are uh mounds that are uh fashioned into the shapes of animals that that take mm -hmm. up va vast expanses the most amount of the biggest concentration of that on earth is in this the state of ohio hmm. so and they were all desecrated for the most part uh and the clay which ohio is very rich in clay the clay from these mounds was used to make the bricks that they built the cities out of. Mm. So you have uh, genocide, gentrification, the desecration of sacred landmarks, <clears throat> all culminating into what could conceivably be one of the largest concentrations of psychic energy in the state, yeah. in, in the United States of America. You know, uh, Pennsylvania is also very rife with it, but that I think has more to do with the Civil War and the amount of massacres on the part of uh, Caucasian settlers against American Indians. Uh, yeah. I, I live in the midst of one right now. I, I mean, this whole valley is just riddled with monuments and, and placards for, uh, you know, this massacre, that massacre, this massacre. There's tons of them everywhere you go. So, I mean, is there something to that? I think so, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I know that Ohio is very strange. I mean, I live in I lived in Northeast Ohio, which is, is like the Cuyahoga National Forest and whatever. We lived right on the Cuyahoga River. Um, and, I mean, I was just there, what, a week before last? And you definitely, like feel stuff when you're there but again like in my brain i'm like well is it just this sort of weird nostalgia are you tapping into some something whatever but i mean i know that at, at least back in the day and i'm in it's well documented or whatever there, there's a tv show about it that there's a lot of like weird kind of occult stuff and like cults there and yeah. like we used to um uh, me and my friends would drive up like, I mean, and I don't know how much truth there is to any of this, but like we would drive up to this place called Boston Heights. And it was always said that like the town was kind of like run by like Satanists or something. And like, if you drive in there, they'll chase you off. And there was supposed to be this like barn that they did stuff in and whatever. And of course us being like teenagers, you know, you got to check this out. Right. Of course. And like more times than not, when we would go, like inevitably there would be some car that would come and follow you. And again, maybe it's coincidence, you know. 
but still it was enough to spook us out you know it was, it's like as soon as the car come would come up behind us and be clearly following us we would always hightail it the hell out of there but yeah you know and and there's a lot of weird stuff i think with like the national guard like the armories and you know i mean the one is well documented the the right patterson or whatever it is i don't know i'm not thinking straight right now i might be mixing up my uh my ufo stuff but um you know there's a lot of weird stuff in ohio just like pennsylvania so i think some people maybe even if it's even if it's like a geological thing where there's you know a high concentration of electromagnetic energy or something and people who are sensitive to that that's really what they're feeling but it's not supernatural it's like energy fields that are natural but your body is kind of sensitive to that stuff you know because i think that kind of stuff's true too mm -hmm. you know no different than like my doctor even told me like i'm one of those people that's like hypersensitive to any even slight change in my system which is why a lot of medicines i can't take and why i have a hard time sometimes with caffeine blah 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 blah, blah. so maybe some people are just like super sensitive to like electricity and like kind of what you were saying earlier with the the old style electricity and that's really what you're picking up and it's not supernatural Mm -hmm. But regardless, it's interesting because I think some people just don't pick up on anything ever or they do and just dismiss it, you know, yeah. and then other people are like looking for something to feel. <laughs> so if, you're, if you're trying to find something, then you're going to find it right. Like a branch hits the window and you're like, oh, it's a ghost. Like, no, it really was just a branch hitting the window. You know? <laughs> but, <clears throat> That's the I, conundrum. <laughs> well, I mean, I think where the conundrum ends is shared experience. Mm. Um, it, and coming from a large family and living in the environment that all of us lived in, uh, there's no question that there was something amiss. Yeah. In all, in all of the places we resided in, up to and including the one I'm in now. As I've said before, I don't think... It was necessarily just the homes. I think I'm just personally haunted mm. <laughs> or, or something. Like it's following you. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and I've had people like, and I'm, I don't put too much stock in people who claim to be psychic. Some, yeah. are, some are sure. Some are definitely just feel they're in they're They're on their own wavelength and they're sure. just we weirdos and that's all they are. Um, but invariably every person I've, I've ever known that I uh, had confidence in as, as a quote unquote psychic has told me the same thing. There's something on you. Mm. I don't like it and I don't want it around me. Yeah. Like, oh, well that's just great. How, <laughs> how do I get rid of it? How about that? Like, give me some, some tips, like some, some, some demon tips. So you know, like help it to help a brother out. And uh, I've had a few tell me, no, you, it's there because you let it be there. And I, I think I can understand where they're coming from with that because I, I am and have always been kind of on the dark side, but I'm also a Christian. So sure. it's, it's a weird toss up. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's what's confusing kind of because, you know, like when, when I became a Christian, I really was, I felt under attack for quite a while. Like, and that's when things got really weird where I would wake up with like welts all over me and now some of, some of that stress, but I never have ever experienced that before since knock on wood. Um, and you know, that's when the whole like scratches in parts of my body that I wouldn't be able to reach and that's when I started getting anxiety attacks, which I'd never had before. And, but then once it was like, okay, well, she's, I guess for real, then that all stopped. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's curious that you continue to have these things, you know, which makes me wonder like, well, what is it then? Because it, it feels, it feels like if it was 
de demonic or something. Like it wouldn't have any cause to be there, right? You would think, but I mean, to me, it almost it it's so natural and normal to me that uh, it doesn't necessarily bother me. I don't feel as if uh, it impedes me in any way, but there are some nights where, you know, I, I still feel, I, I feel something there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've had ex-girlfriends flee whatever apartment I was in because they would hear a woman walking around my room saying, hello, oh. very, very rational people nonetheless sure. who didn't necessarily believe in anything and uh the the woman i was with for a very long time before my wife she refused to stay in my apartment she's like no your your apartment's haunted and i don't even believe in ghosts and your apartment's haunted and i was <laughs> like well it's not really my apartment this has been going on since i was a kid so you know? does your son pick up on any of like does he ever act like you can tell he's seeing something or yeah He's uh, sadly, my son has uh, been exhibiting behaviors that are uh, very reminiscent of mine when I was his age uh, with the sleep issues. Um, mm. I, I still occasionally sleepwalk. My my wife oh, actually was just she was just yelling at me about it because I uh, I do ridiculous shit like uh, <laughs> that's creepy. My my. Uh, my wife and son, you know, are African American in heritage and, and their hair is vast. Well, I don't have hair, but even if I still did, <laughs> um, it, 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 it's not like theirs. Okay. And they have to use different products like oils and, and, and the like. And one night very recently, I had started to take these oils that the two of them absolutely need for their hair and pouring them into the sink and making some sort of soup out of them all plugged up the sink all the oil that we spent money on for, for hair. It's all in the sink. It's, it's all there. And some toothpaste. I, I did, I was doing something. I don't know what I thought I was doing, but I was making something. And then I gave up and went back to bed. Creepy. It's well, I, I used to drive for cigarettes in my sleep. I'd you don't up. take uh, sleep aids. Do you? No. Okay. Cause I know some people like I had a, a couple friends that would like, cook full meals and have no idea they'd wake up the next day and they'd have like all this stuff in their kitchen like what the hell sleep but aids. they were taking sleep aids sleep aids keep me up mm -hmm. i can't go to sleep on them but uh i it's it's nowhere near what it used to be i have um sleep paralysis and i sleep walk and i sleep talk <laughs> oh, creepy <laughs> He talks in his sleep. He sings in his sleep. Uh, he hasn't been like ambulating yet in his sleep, thankfully, but he's exhibiting some behaviors that are very reminiscent of his dad. And he definitely does see things that most people do not because you'll, you'll watch him just laughing at things that aren't there looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. My terrible <laughs> genetics. <laughs> When Dirk was a baby, um, well, he wasn't a baby. He was a toddler. But this, he was sick. Like, he used to get sick all the time because he was in daycare, right? Mm -hmm. And um, one time he was probably only like maybe three years old, maybe not even three years old. And he told us that there were these three light beings standing over his bed. And he wasn't afraid of them or anything. They were just there. But like he could tell you right now, like he what what they looked like. They just looked like these light beings. And then he had these other um, things happening where he was seeing like a shadow person, and that did scare him. It never did anything though. It just would stand there. But he didn't like it. Like that one freaked him out. Um, Got a dog coming over here. Um, <laughs> so, like, he's definitely had some strange things like that too. But mostly, they've they mostly it was positive, like with the the light beings. And I remember when he was wee little, I used to ask him questions about stuff because I'm like, you know, they're closer to the before 
than yeah. we are. And so maybe there's some residual memory of maybe what what's there before you get here. Yeah. And I used to ask him questions and he used to tell me some really interesting stuff. Um, you know, as a wee little kid, because I Dirk's been talking like full conversation since he started talking. So we used to, you know, ask him all kinds of stuff. And, like, he would give these really interesting answers. And I wish I had written them all down because some of it was like, oh, wow. Like, you know, like, I I remember asking him where he was before he was here and, like, stuff like that. And he gave really interesting answers. But I've I've since forgotten because that's how my brain works. Um, uh, When I I talked to uh, Malarkey on the podcast, Michael Malarkey, the actor, he said the same thing. You know, the kid the kids know things because they were they were there more recently than we were. Yeah. Right. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it's funny because both of my children had imaginary friends just like their dad, and their mothers did not. Uh see, I'm so glad Dirk never had that because that shit freaks me out. Well, I had one and it freaked me out when I had him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's weird that he'd seen shadow people too, because my first my first memory of life was a shadow person. It was my the first thing I remember of being alive. Um, that and uh, really soon thereafter, Jimmy Carter uh, leaving office. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. It, it, my first memory is a shadow person shaking its finger at me and and scaring the shit out of me. And then I remember him giving his speech when he was leaving office. <laughs> I feel like my first real news memory was when Elvis died. Like, I really remember that. And I can remember us watching Muhammad Ali on but fight, fighting on. I can remember that, too. I wonder what fight that was. Yeah, it, it would have had to have been towards the end. I'm I'm not that old. No, no. I but mean, I can we're... remember. I can remember my parents having that on, and I can remember Elvis dying. Yeah, and, and he. I was pretty small. Yeah, he he died when we were babies. Basically, we were yeah. very young. Yeah, um, but I can but... remember being on the news because my. I mean, I can remember seeing like them showing the coffin, and you know. All that kind of stuff. So, I don't know. Anyway, not supernatural. <laughs> no, no, no. But still, I mean, it, it's it's funny the things you remember from when you were young. Um, most of the stuff that sticks out is is really fucked up, though. From when I was really little, like yeah. I, I, I I woke up uh, in my kitchen when I was like my son's age. I woke up and I w- I had no clothes on. And I was freezing cold and my parents came downstairs and they, they were freaking out. They're like, what are you doing down here? And why are you naked? And I'm like, I don't know. I just want my clothes on. <laughs> just weird stuff would happen like that. So I was probably sleepwalking from yeah. the time I could walk, you know, uh, I mean, I had an incredible Hulk lamp in my bedroom. Yeah. That my, my, uh, aunt and uncle were both into, uh, making ceramics because that was a big thing in the 70s oh yeah and the incredible hulk tv show was big in the 70s yep so i had an, a really nice ceramic incredible hulk lamp and i don't know what i was thinking but i woke up and i had to pee and i was always afraid of this incredible hulk lamp so i, I peed on the incredible hulk lamp and it was plugged in how do you think that ended for me? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, Can you yeah. Death by peeing on Incredible Hulk. Well, I mean that would be <laughs> apropos for me, probably. But you know, uh, wow. I, yeah, yeah. I, I I remember like screaming when it was all over, and my parents came running upstairs, and they were not happy with me. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is bizarre. Like I'm not a sleepwalker. I think I've like I've woken myself up crying and laughing before. That's not weird at all. But this is weird to me that happens. Well, first of all, well, that's a whole nother thing. So what you remember when Paranormal Activity came out, that movie? 
Yeah. Mike and I went to see that, right? Bad mistake because anything like demonic just really freaks me out. And I've since realized that and I don't watch anything like that anymore. But like, so we went to go see that movie. Most people think it's dumb, whatever. It bothered me because it reminded me of things like the way the, the same feeling I got back when I was like in the occult and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so we came home, turned the TV on, sleeping on the couch, like fell asleep on the couch, whatever. And all of a sudden my leg flew off the couch. And <laughs> now sometimes you have like things like that where you'll just have involuntary like muscle movement or whatever. But it was like my leg flung off the couch. And it creeped me out so bad because like one of the worst scenes in that whole movie to me was the, when the when they just get up out of bed and stand beside the bed because it's so fucked up that yeah. it was like for like eight hours or something. Yeah. And when stuff like that completely freaks me out. And just the thought that you're asleep and something could be hovering over you that you are completely unaware of. Yeah. But anyway, so that happened to me and like it completely worded me out because, you know, the context of that movie and then that happened and I probably didn't even sleep well for like a week after that or something. But the, it's the same thing that happened to me when I saw The Exorcist for the first time and only time because I'll never watch it again. Wow. That kind of stuff just completely affects me on a level that I know better than to even go there with it. And I know that's probably seems super silly to people because it's just a movie or whatever, but I don't know. Like it, it felt like, I, and I've talked to Tim about this too before, like certain things I don't like to talk about a whole lot because I'm afraid of like drawing it or yeah. like, Oh, you don't like that. Well, guess who's going to come visit you? You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of crap like that just freaks me out. So like the whole sleepwalking thing, no, thank you. I had a friend that used to sleep talk, and that was weird enough. Like, she would be awake, full on having a conversation with you, sound asleep. And I'm like, who even is in there right now? Like, what am I talking to? Like, just. I, f I, I have some I have some really messed up sleep issues. Like, I, I can also fall asleep while I'm standing and talking to you. I, my wife has witnessed it a million times. She knows when it's happening, when where most people would not, because she knows she sees what my, you look like. She knows my what my eyes do and stuff. Like, yeah, I just go. I'm gone, and I'm still talking. I'm still Ew. making sense, but I'm gone. <laughs> I don't like it's, it's because I sleep two hours a night, like like solidly. Um, True. So I'm I'm exhausted, basically all the time, but. Yeah, the the whole sleep thing, that's that's got to get worked out <laughs> someday. I've had sleep studies done. They just try to give me drugs. I won't take the drugs yeah. because I get weirder. Right. But I think you're tapped into something, too, when, when your mind is kind of wandering in that somnambulant state. Uh, yeah. And it, it clears some things out that, that need clearing out, and I don't get that because I don't get enough of right. said sleep. Maybe I need to smoke pot. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what yeah, I'm doing wrong. Probably can't hurt, but yeah, it's such a weird thing, sleep. Like I have always fought sleep. Like I don't like it because I feel like it's a waste of time. Yeah. But by the same token, I love dreams. So because it's so fascinating to me, like what the hell's happening? Like sometimes it feels like your brain's just making a little movie. And then other times it feels like there's more to this. Like, how can I dream about this completely detailed place with people I've never met before who are fully realized human beings and like certain recurring dreams. Mike has very specific detailed recurring dreams of this place and time that feels so real to him that he's like, you know, and he's very pragmatic about everything. But even he's like, there's something to that. Like, it's like a premonition of the future or like there's something to it because it's too vividly specific and whatever. And then even 
you know, dreams about people who have died. Like, I ha I've, lately I've been dreaming about my dad a lot. And it's it's creeps me out kind of when this happens because I'm like, I always get like this paranoid thing of like, are you saying I'm coming closer to you? Or like, you know, I don't even want to say it out loud because I don't want to weird myself out. But like, whenever I have dreams about people who are dead, I'm like, okay, sometimes it feels like just a dream. Yeah. Other times it feels like they're really there. And then other times I'm like, are you trying to tell me something that I don't want to know? You know? <laughs> yeah. Like I'm coming there soon. Don't want to know that. Kind of creeped out by it. Nobody wants to know when they're going to go. Um, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is just reckoning with the passing of people who have gone before us. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. My, my sister, Samantha who is my youngest female sister. <clears throat> I have to say that because I have so many fucking siblings. Uh, but <laughs> my youngest female uh, sibling, Samantha, uh, my dad lived with her right before he died. And they have an apartment in their basement that they had for him. Mm -hmm. Since my father has passed, the dog, they have a big German shepherd named Nicky. He's massive. He's about 125 pounds. He's a fucking monster. Uh, but the dog is terrified to go down the stairs. None of her kids will go down there. And she sh sent me video of the basement door rattling and shaking and the dog freaking out. No. There's no way anyone could get down there. And yeah, that's crazy. Believe me, if anyone got into that house, that dog would eat. Sure. Them. You know, yeah. he, he knows me and he barely lets me through the house. Yeah. So <clears throat> she, her husband is convinced it's my dad and Samantha and I are convinced it is not because yeah. my dad for all of his failings would not be trying to scare his adult children because my father loved us tremendously. <laughs> well, and also animals aren't usually triggered in a negative way towards people unless they're not nice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I mean, I'm not saying my dad was nice because he wasn't, <laughs> but he loved us. But he knew very, him, right? He knew him. And, you know, Nikki loved my dad. Uh, this is this is some negative stuff that I think my dad had oh. in tow. <clears throat> my dad mm -hmm. carried a spirit with him, too, at least one um, <clears throat> that I think I told you uh, when he was in Vietnam, he used to tell me he was blown up in an airstrike, but he yeah, had actually. Yeah. He actually OD'd on speed. Yeah. He was like 19 years old and they were staying awake on patrol and he took too much speed. They were all doing speed. That's what they did. All the soldiers yeah. over there. Um, he OD'd and he was looking down at his own body. He vividly remembers having an out of body experience. And then he remembers his consciousness getting sucked into a void and things whispering to him and pulling him down into the blackness. No. And then he wakes he wakes up in his body. So he was convinced that he was going somewhere bad because he was raised a Catholic and had killed a bunch of people in in, in Asia uh because that's sure. what the country told him to do. It was Vietnam. But that was his that's what he believed. So that's creepy, dude. Yeah. So it was everything that we'd experienced when we were children due to something that attached itself to my dad when his body died. Oh God, that gave me the chills. Think about it though. I mean, the math, the math is there. Um, is it, is it logical? Fuck no. Right. None but, of does, it. but does it add up? Kind of. Yeah. Oh, it creeps me out so bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Hey, it's Halloween, man. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, you know, it's funny. I'm like, should I wear a Halloween costume? I know I always kind of look like I'm wearing a Halloween costume. But I, I, I put on makeup, but, but then my skin got itchy because that's why yeah. I look like I'm broken out because I don't uh, I don't wear makeup well. <laughs> I'm too yeah. sensitive. I know. I was going to like all like goth out and then I, I did the same thing. I washed it all off. And I'm like, you know what? 
I'm it's more of a costume for me not to have anything on than it is to, <laughs> right? to curl my hair and put on a pink sweater, maybe that would be my creepy <laughs> costume. I'm gonna get all John Waters for everybody. Look at this. Um, but there's uh there's something to that, I think. Mm. With my old man. Yeah, because. that definitely feels likely. And even even if his his Catholic guilt or whatever over what he had done, of not even of his own volition, really, maybe that weight of all of that manifested, you know, because I can, like, I, I know you're not supposed to ask people like in, in those situations, like, well, how do you feel about the fact that you killed people? Like, and it's a very, I know it's very taboo and I would never insult anybody by asking that, but that has to weigh heavy on you. you I've, know? I've probably asked about a dozen veterans that question because i was related to all of them so it was a fair yeah, game sure three of which were in the vietnam war one of which was a, a highly decorated hero my uncle um and it's a resounding the worst possible feeling you could feel on earth until it starts to kind of get good and that's the fucked up part because mm -hmm. you get so conditioned and used to taking life or just the idea that you may have taken a life where you're a kid okay you're an 18 year old 19 year old boy you're still a dick right you're still full of vim vigor piss and vinegar and it even though video games didn't exist at that time it, that's what it probably turned into for them just like it, there was no human being at the end of it they were targets and my mm -hmm. father legitimately told me that that wasn't a person that was a target that was drilled into them this is a target that's not a person they have no consequence wipe them out and the first time you do it is the worst time you do it then it gets good to you then when it's all over and you come home and you cycle into the world again as they say uh the vietnam guys say that anyway i don't know about any veteran of another foreign war uh they'd call it you know you cycle back into the world and you don't fit and you're more afraid of being home and being a husband and a father than you are of going into a rice paddy and shooting at, v at Vietnamese people. Yeah. That's, that's horror. That's horror. <laughs> it really is. And if you think about how sick our world is, that it's completely unnecessary yeah. that anybody should have to go through that one way or the, on either side of that, like, our world is so sick. Like yeah. you, I mean, really, that's the horror of it. Really, ghosts and goblins and whatever. That's more fun. That's all in the mind. The rest of mm -hmm. it, real, true horror, is looking around. Right. That's. I, I think that's what makes all of my fascinations with the macabre so innocent in a way. Even if I do, I do kind of, there's an element of reality to it for me because it's not, it's not Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. It's not like, right. and I have, it's be mystical. I have beef with this whole Jeffrey Dahmer TV show shit. My wife loves that true crime stuff. I can't fucking stomach it. And I am a horror movie buff. It's my shit, right? Yeah. You could write about slaughtering hundreds of people if it's fake and i'm way good with that the second it becomes reality there's something in me that there's a revulsion mm -hmm. a true and utter revulsion because I, i'm way too empathetic for that shit <laughs> you know i i, yeah. I, when, I when i was I in college that. when i was in college it was one thing i i wrote about it because you know i'd minored in in sociology so there was a lot of psych classes going on and you know, I'd, I'd written, I'd written a paper on Dahmer because it was topical at the time, mm -hmm. but he terrified the shit out of me. But, but within the context of this paper, my argument for him was he wasn't truly psychotic because he knew what he was doing was wrong. He did it because he fucking loved it. Mm -hmm. So my argument was, can there be true human evil? 
And if there is, he's a prime example. He knew what he yeah. was doing was wrong. He, he just loved it. You know, that. so he wasn't insane. If you know what you're doing is wrong, you're not insane. No, absolutely not. I don't know. You know, I think everybody's an individual case. But um, my problem with true crime, I first of all, I'm fascinated by human beings and what makes their brains tick. So I'm interested in that. My problem with it is the people that act like these people are cool. Yeah. yeah like, I, I see so many people who think, like, Manson was cool and, like, Richard Ramirez is the big one. I'm like, really? You think that guy's fucking cool? Have you read what he did? I wrote to him in college because, you know, the whole psych class thing. I, he, if you would write to him, he would write back. I'd written him one letter and he wrote a very detailed letter with a sketch on it. And uh, uh, that cured me of ever wanting to uh, reach out to someone of that caliber ever again. Not necessarily because what he'd said was that revolting because it, it really wasn't. It was how he tried to charm me. Mm. You like heavy metal, don't you? What are you into? I like this, this, and this. Do you have a picture you can send me? This, this, and this. And it, it was very, it, even though the uh, his penmanship was poor, and his, uh, you know, <laughs> spelling was deplorable. You could tell that this guy was a predator. And sure. he was, even though he had no, I, he didn't, I, I don't fit his mold of what he wants to kill. He kills. He kills because it gets him off. I don't, I don't want that. I don't want anything to do with that. Fuck that. You know, and like, I... That's why, like, I don't even like, I don't like horror films unless they're like the classical type horror films of boogeymen and ghosts and Go gothic like, because, horror. Yeah, because anything that's like slasher or whatever, I'm like, that can really happen. Like, I don't find that entertaining for me personally. I mean, you people can like whatever they want. Yeah. But like, that kind of stuff always bothered me more than like ghosts and stuff because. Like, you can really be in your house and somebody decide to terrorize you. Yeah. Or, you know, one of the reasons why I'm like, I ain't never going fucking camping or whatever is because I'm like, that shit can really happen. There's killers in the woods, okay? That yeah. happens. It happened here, like, like a decade ago or something. Yeah. Somebody was killing people that were camping. I'm like, that's why my ass ain't ever doing it. <laughs> or even like, even the thought of renting a cabin someplace, and I'm like, it sounds good in theory, but I know the entire time I would be there, I would be like, waiting for the killer to show up. Like, that's just where my brain works. So I don't find like any enjoyment at all watching like gore, or like slasher or anything, because I'm like, that shit can really happen. It has really happened. It continues to really happen and will continue to really happen. I'm not entertained by that. Give me ghosts and vampires and werewolves and yeah. like sci-fi and, you know, this supernatural stuff. The demon stuff freaks me out, but, you know, that's maybe a little too relatable to me for me to find any kind of fun in it. Right. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I, and I, I, again, I completely understand true crime. I, I'm fascinated by it also, but in a, in a like, almost like the same reason why I like watching like reality TV because I find human beings completely fascinating. Like okay. you could fuck me down in a mall and I would be like their character sketching every single person that I'm looking at. Right. Like that's just kind of whatever, but the hero worship of it and the like, Oh, I'm going to get my, like, cool Richard Ramirez t-shirt. Like, what are you finding cool about this guy? Like, I don't think you would have thought he was cool if he was doing that shit to you or your loved one. Yeah. You know, whatever. And same thing it, with the Charles Manson worship of it all, because, right. like, he, was, he wasn't he was even cool enough to kill people himself. He was just this douchebag, douchebag. psychopath who was an ex-pimp 
who knew how to control people's minds via right. uh, LSD. That's not that's not sexy. It's not cool. It's not even really that interesting. He was just a fucking whack job. And if right. you watch videos of him, the way he speaks, yes, it's very compelling because he could have been a snake oil salesman in the 1920s or uh, a mega church. <laughs> <laughs> or he could have been uh, uh, Joel Osteen right now. Right. You know, um, this mega church wackadoo who, you know, is telling women what to do with their bodies and or, or Jesus or else Jesus will this, this and this to you, sure. which is against the Bible. Fuckhead. But <laughs> there's um, there's nothing cool about this. There's nothing uh, rem remotely even kitschy about it. It's just yeah. dumb. Interesting thinking how that person's brain works. Absolutely. Like sure. interesting how they could manipulate so many people. Yeah. It's the same thing why I'm, I'm interested. Like I'm super fascinated by cults and like, I like, I love watching stuff about cults because it fascinates me that, and I, I'm not saying I'm above it. I'm sure put me in the right situation and I could get sucked in just like anybody else could, because we're not all, you know, everybody's got their key that the person gets, you know, finds the right key and they can do whatever to you. Mm -hmm. But like, it's just super fascinating to me. Um, but I don't find it cool. No, <laughs> like, not at all. It's not cool. And and the thing is, like this this whole Dahmer uh, Netflix series. I find it to be, I, it's pornography in my opinion. That's how I, I view it was from the bits I've seen of it is Evan Peters, an incredible, incredible actor. Yes. That doesn't forgive the fact that the victim's families wanted nothing to do with this, did not want it made. And yeah. they, they're basically making money off of their pain. That's where I get pissed. Yeah. That's where I lose my patience. That's why I won't watch it. Yeah, and I haven't watched any of it, which is kind of surprising because I am like, I guess maybe because Dahmer lived not far from me in Ohio. And like, I knew people that live by him. Mm -hmm. So it was always kind of like fascinating to the, uh, to us because we're like, holy shit, this guy's like from here. Right. Yeah. Um. So I, like I have an interest in watching that, but like Mike started watching it and he's like, don't, don't waste your, like, he, I think he got through maybe one episode and he was like, don't, don't do it. It's, it's, it's pornographic in my opinion and not in a sexual way, but in, in a, in a exposition. Way. Yeah. It, it exploits. And, uh, when Nicole from soft kill, uh, she, she posted about, the unfortunate things in her family's life, you know, and how she feels the same way that I do, that this is just exploitation and it's unnecessary. I, I, I was a hundred percent on board with it. I, I liked it immediately. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that because I can't, I can't abide by it. Yeah. That doesn't make me the morality police. You can do right. whatever you want. Everybody can do whatever they want, but for my money, for my tastes, give me Mike Flanagan, doing uh you know house on haunted hill or uh the haunting of hill house mm -hmm. and and all that other stuff on netflix if you want good horror that's well wrought and creepy mm -hmm. and will keep you up at night mm -hmm. watch the haunting of hill house on netflix it's yeah that's a good fucking great midnight mass mm -hmm. is a masterpiece so it's good. So the, good. the best vampire show i think i've ever seen in my life and yeah, that's not was not taking anything away from Vampire Diaries because my homie's in that, but still, you know, the this is truly like terrifying in a very, especially for a Catholic, in a very, very big way. <laughs> yeah, and it was really like, I guess because you know maybe at our age or whatever we're going through these sort of existential crises all the time where we're overanalyzing everything. I think it hit from that side, like that point of it. Like I, I think some people are irritated with all the long conversations. I'm like, not me, because these are conversations that I have, and or at least think about in my head. So they all, you know, just and it was the so love good. Story, the love story in it is. <sighs> magnificent 
it's absolutely like the way the way it all like builds to him confessing what had happened to him on the on the rowboat mm -hmm. in the bay or whatever and and the sun comes up and he burns to ash in front of her and they've been in love with each other since they're kids there's just something very poignant about that and i think i think had i seen that 25 years ago i would have shit all over it now mm -hmm. no no that's to me that's yeah. perfect yeah i like we we liked it i mean dirk watched it too he even liked it but yeah just really a good a good show mm -hmm. and hill house is really good too i I started watching, um, is it Bly Manor? Bly Manor. It's the turn of the screw. Yeah. I started watching that one and then the boys fell asleep. And so we just never got back to it. Not because it wasn't good. We just, you know, you know how life is. Sure. So I, but Mike has since watched it. I need to watch that one all. There's so many good shows that I need to watch and just, you know, finding the time to do it and, I ended up I end up just watching stupid crap because my brain is always so exhausted and like needing comfort food. Yeah. That I end up just watching the same stuff over and over that I know is gives me that I get oxytocin or whatever. <laughs> uh, it, it was just a great time, I think, to be alive to, to to see these things. Just like, even though you're terrified of The Exorcist, and I was too, when The Exorcist first hit cable, I was a little kid. You know, it had come out far, far before I was uh, around. I think. I think it came out in like '74 mm -hmm. or, or something think. like that. But it, things, it took a long time for things to hit cable. Cable was a new thing when I was a small child. But we had Prism. And Prism played R-rated movies all day long. There was no, like, 8 o'clock at night, now we get into the dark stuff. It was just on. And yeah. I remember kept being alone watching Casper the Friendly Ghost <laughs> and going up to that massive wooden unit that was our TV that had an eight track player and a record player on it too. No. Oh. And switching to Prism because I knew how to get there. And I, I watched like these terrible movies. <laughs> <laughs> I watched these terrible movies. One, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a splatter rape revenge epic that's known in like the dark underground circles of, of, of film called Gator Bait. Gator Bait's a terrible movie for any human being to watch. I was three. Oh, terrible. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> there's a point in that movie where a guy takes a double barrel shotgun, shoves it up into a woman's womanhood, and pulls the trigger. <laughs> Good lord. And here I am watching it, but that didn't scar me as much as that, that first viewing of The Exorcist. You know, a little Catholic kid, God fearing, <laughs> and seeing all of the things that Reagan does to herself, uh, it just fucked me all the I way. Know. You know, all the way like, up. Oh, I don't even like, like, I don't like to even, because uh, like you said earlier about the empathy thing, that's why I have a hard time watching anything like super gory or whatever, because that's all I can, I mean, I it's like I feel it, you know? Yeah. And uh, that, that, yeah, the exorcist just, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> 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 yeah. You know another movie that did that to me too was The Ring, mm-hmm. but it, but the thing of it is, the part of The Ring that got me was that actual video, like the weird black, just like random black and white images of it. Yeah, um, that's what freaked me out. And like after I went to bed that night, I kept dreaming of that fucking tree because mm-hmm. there's the one scene, there's like the one scene in the the video of just that tree on the hill. Yeah. And I kept, like, every time I would close my eyes, I saw that image, and it completely freaked me out. So um, you have to see Ringu, because the oh, Japanese... Oh, I did. I saw that, too. That, that is just very, very uh, disturbing, to say the yeah, least. it is. For the same oh. reasons. And it's funny, because, um, like, Dirk likes to watch scary movies and stuff, and, like, we don't let him watch anything that's got, like, any kind of sexual anything in it. So we're super careful about that kind of stuff. But um, he's Mike's like, oh, we can watch The Ring. And I'm like, no, I don't want to watch The Ring. I don't want to watch The Ring because I had such a weird reaction to it the prior time. And finally, I'm like, fine, whatever. And of course, like Dirk's not even scared by it. And like the second time I watched it, I'm like, this really wasn't scary. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it was about it the first time. But like the video itself is what freaked me out. Not so much the movie. Um, I think that's what got people about the Blair Witch too. I mean, yeah. and and that movie scared me. Upon repeat viewings, I think that's a masterpiece. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'd seen it when it had first come out, and it wasn't in regular theaters. It was in like the little draft house style theaters. Mm-hmm. Same with Paranormal Activity. I saw before it got uh, picked up by yeah. Paramount. I saw it when it had the original ending, before Steven Spielberg. Uh, decided to buy the rights and become exact producer on it. Uh, but when I'd seen the original Blair Witch, it number one, it made me nauseous a little bit because of the movement. I totally had anxiety yeah. <laughs> the whole time. It gave me anxiety. Uh, the 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 movement and and the 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 documentary quality Mm-hmm. made what the websites for the film at the time feel very plausible because if mm-hmm. you recall the way they had touted this it was like it was, was real. it was real it was something yeah. that happened and i was having arguments with friends my late friend hans who passed away he he was no dude look it's real look at this look at we were living together at the time we were like in our early 20s it's like no dude look it's a real deal man this is a real thing I was like, Hans, if, if, if people really died, they wouldn't be releasing this as a movie. <laughs> yeah. Like they, they wouldn't, the Weinsteins wouldn't be able to get the rights. You know, the, the families would. Yeah. Put the skids to that. But that's what people thought though at the time, you know, yeah. but the quality of it, the, uh, just how home spun it felt worked in its favor. As For sure. Well- as well as the la- there was a complete lack of a script everybody yeah. everybody got their daily lines given to them in film canisters that they left mm-hmm. outside of the tents and they would legitimately like when you would hear people fucking with the tent and making noises yeah they were really scared because they really yeah. didn't know what the fuck was going on right <laughs> yeah and that and, and honestly that was sort of genius yeah. And um, because I know a lot of people are like, this movie's dumb. It's not even scary. I'm like, have you ever been out in the woods? Yes, it is scary. That's like yeah. the whole thing. Like Mike and I lived in that apartment where we recorded cold and all that stuff. And yeah. like right behind our house was a, was a field. And 
woods for miles and miles and miles. And like we came home, we we saw like the midnight showing of that movie or whatever. Yeah. And at the time, people didn't know for sure if it was real or not. So there was like this thing of like, well, maybe it is real, maybe it isn't real, whatever. We watched the movie. I I totally had anxiety the entire time. I don't know why. Just I guess because it felt real. And I could relate to it because I'm like, if I was out in the fucking woods and that shit was going on, I would like, I'm a, I'm scared of the woods anyway. Hmm. So, yeah, anyway, we came home that night and both of us were just like scurrying up to the house to get in the building, you know, <laughs> um, totally funny. But like, yeah, that was the, and, and we've let Dirk watch that movie because, you know, there's really nothing bad in it. And he, that's one movie that does scare him. And he doesn't get, like, he really doesn't get scared by stuff. Like, he, he's not, like, we've let him watch The Shining. And, like, I'm, you know, we make him close his eyes during certain parts. But yeah. with na- naked old ladies and whatever. But, like, that doesn't scare him. Like, nothing really scares him. But Blair Witch definitely creeped him out. He got creeped out by that one. The Shining is the movie that has scared me the most in life. Yeah, that one horrified me as a child. Like, I don't know why my mom and dad were allowing me, because I would have been very little, why I was allowed to watch that. Mm -hmm. But that movie scared the fuck out of me as a kid. But now it's my favorite film. Yeah, but here's the vision I'm getting. You probably watched the ABC special version of it where they cut all of the vulgarity and nudity out of it, right? But still. And still. It the is. twins, though. Oh, come play with us, Danny, forever. Yeah. And, and that scene where Jack Nicholson goes into the room with the woman. And see, I didn't see a cut version of it because she was full on naked. Okay, so from you, my well, recollection, but like just that scene where she goes from being this young, beautiful woman to this corpse. Yeah, horrifying. Yeah, and That's- the scene that always sticks with me most now as an adult is. When Wendy finds his manuscript and it's nothing but the same fucking line over and over for all, all work and no play like makes this. Jack a dull boy. All work yeah. and no play makes Jack and a dull boy. And you realize he's been crazy the entire fucking time. Here's the genius of of uh, Kubrick. Okay, I had read The Shining when I was eight or nine. I I, I was an advanced reader. Kanan is an advanced reader. He knows how to read already. Uh, not at any great length, but he's three. He's reading. I was three. I was reading. Mm-hmm. The first King novel I had read was Pet Cemetery when it came out. And then directly thereafter, I picked The Shining off the shelf because I'd seen the movie already. So I thought I knew what I was getting into. Mm-hmm. And I was so disappointed when I read the novel and he was related. Jack was not only relatable, but a nice guy who was conflicted. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the movie, he was never a nice guy. Mm -mm. No, he was abusive. He was a fucking, he was a fucking horrible guy. And there were even allusions to sexual abuse on his end. If you watch the movie, Um, there is just so much evil in Jack Nicholson in that film that Stephen King, Stephen King was pissed because Kubrick had made him so unlikable. Mm -hmm. And I understand his thoughts because it wasn't the character he'd written. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there was no dichotomy, you know, there was no degradation of, of, of a good man torn down to a, 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 a withering husk of a demon of a person in in the shining it started off there was still there there was so much tension he was he was a a dry alcoholic abusive had broken his son's arm possible sexual issues and then you get into the hotel Mm -hmm. and it, it goes from you know some bad shit with him to complete and utter unabashed terror and the ghosts are helping him to be even worse yeah and then by the end his face is in the picture from a party that had happened like almost 80 years ago at that point 
as if to say he'd always been there. He'd always mm-hmm. been one of them. Uh, it's a mind fuck. And, and yeah. if you watch the documentary surrounding it, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of it's bullshit. Like people come up with all of this weird stuff with uh, the slaughter of the American Indians, which all they're basing that off of is a cleaning product that's in constant stock in the background of the film. But Kubrick is known for, you know, the little things, the, the, the minutia that is actually at the heart of a film. You know, I, none of us will ever know what the man was really aiming for, but the guy in the dog mask giving a blow job to the other guy, it, it's like, it, it's, it's all, it all adds up. To, I mean, of course I didn't know that was what was going on as a kid. But it, but it you was out. so scary because it was so out of context and like what is what like what the hell's happening? It was so lot, scary to me. A lot of it had to do with sound design and the way he shot mm-hmm. things too. It was meant to be off-putting to you. It was meant to yeah. be to set you on edge. Um yeah. and no one could do that quite like Stanley Kubrick. Mm-hmm. And so I good. I still don't think he filmed the moon landing. I'm sorry everybody no, <laughs> i don't i don't i think we were we were really there uh yeah. but he was a genius and there's no question and you know i think eyes wide shut was a great film a lot of people incredible. i got a into a huge like fight. That. i got so into a fun. huge fight with the girl that i was with at the time like right after that movie ended huge fight yeah. and that was like in the newspapers like couples were fighting after this movie because it examined uh, the desires of, of, of women to be, you know, unfaithful or, or they're just, you know, their fantasies and, and that masculine uh, uh, drive to be the dominant force in the woman in your life's life. It called all this into question. He did that on purpose. That was very, very intentional, mm-hmm. you know, because that is the genius of Kubrick. He, he, he's an auteur, but he's also an antagonist. And mm-hmm. that's, I think that's what makes his, his film so beautiful. And so, so, uh, you know, longstanding, you'll never, you'll never find another quite like him because he made things to piss you off. He did was, things to make you uncomfortable. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, even, Adding the whole Illuminati aspect to it, which of course you know I'm completely fascinated by. Oh, me too. Me too. So good. It was just so good, and like the fact that it's Tom Cruise and his wife. I mean, Mm -hmm. and they got divorced pretty soon thereafter. (laughs) Like that added a whole nother, you know, because at the time people weren't scared of Tom Cruise really yet. (laughs) Right. Right. But yeah, just super good. Super good. And you look and at that. The soundtracks are always amazing. Yes, yes, because his his taste for classical, mm-hmm. bar none. But if you look at someone like Shelley Duvall, who survived working with Kubrick, who she blame she blames Stanley Kubrick for her mental state right now. I don't think that's the case. I think she was always a little, yeah, loopy. Uh, nothing against her. I have mental issues too. I, I, I'm right. I'm right there with you, Shelly. But you know, she went from being all of oil to <laughs> yeah, getting savaged day in and day out by not only Stanley but Kubrick's young daughter, uh, making a documentary about the whole thing behind the scenes, and and Stanley told Jack Nicholson and everyone else to basically mentally abuse her for the entirety yeah. of the shoot she was she was laying bare it was it was a terrible experience for her i'm sure of it because stanley was a lot of things but he was not a humanitarian right um it, it it's telling it's very telling that she's in the state that she's in now you know it's interesting too like everything around his death and stuff you know mm-hmm. and there's always so many conspiracy theories about all of that that all ties into that moon landing stuff though, mm-hmm. that, that he, you know, shot a film on the set of uh space odyssey, uh, that faked the moon landing. 
do I think that's true? No. Do I think he was tied in with some people that were probably not very good? Sure. Why not? It's all it's all fascinating. It is. It is. And I think the most fascinating thing is the numerology of his films. Numbers played very heavily into all of his work, the room numbers in The Shining, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the way certain scenes were, were blocked in certain time frames. Uh, they repeat themselves and repeat themselves and repeat themselves. It's, he was, he was a genius. He had an IQ similar to Einstein's, mm -hmm. you know, I have a high IQ. That gentleman had an incredible IQ that that's like insurmountable to share a space with someone like that. It had to be kind of terrifying. <laughs> The smarter people get, the more cre the more creepy and crazy they are. That's just seems that just seems to be a fact. <laughs> I uh, intimidating I, at least intimidating, but the, some people would call it. Uh, you know, you know, they're just a little. I, I don't know the word for it. They're they're just odd. You know, they're they're a little eccentric. Mm -hmm. But I think the smarter you get, the more life's mysteries become less mysterious and you become more numb. And mm -hmm. when you become more numb, you become more cold. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the frightening part, you know? When it all, when everything boils down to logic, there's no romance. Yeah, that kind of goes back to the very first stuff we were talking about where I'm like, you know, I want there to be magic and i want there to be real reality behind folklore and you know i, think I, wanted, makes, I wanted it to be that way i think that makes your writing make a lot of sense too because it is very gothic and in, in not in a goth rock sense but in, in a horror sense but even more so in a in a, uh, a romantic sense there, there there's a a, a deep-seated uh, seemingly unrequited romance to the the entire saga, and it and it continues until today with Roman, and 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 it it makes it kind of it quantifies that, you know that that that's how you feel because that's what you write, and that's how you write, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I was just telling, I did a podcast last week or a couple days ago actually it wasn't even that long ago and i was saying like every song i've ever written it, it's love death time like it's all and it's i get and i it dawned on me like that's basically the same thing with my books that i write like it's always centered around those three things the passing of time the evils of you know the the horror of time love and death it's all i i don't know it's it, like you said it's like an unrequited thing you know yeah, yeah it's this it's what the germans say uh sensucht, you know uh a longing for something that isn't there uh that's that's what that means like you you're, you're trying to attain something but you don't know what it is yeah and i and can't get the words right None of us can. That's why there's no word for it in English. There's only a word for it in German. That's it. <laughs> it's it's this thing that we can't quite get to. This thing that we're trying to attain. This thing that this completion. Oh, that's where Hyreth is too. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, it's it's this longing for something that I don't quite know what it is. And I think if we were to find it then the search is the over and then, yeah it, the magic's gone the magic's yeah. gone we're supposed to chase it that's that's it's what like, it is to be honest. don't you feel like you're always sort of mourning like i'm always i feel like i feel like i'm always mourning something that i don't and it goes it goes back from the time i was a little kid it's like mm. this mourning for something and i don't i'm not sure what it is like i'm not meant i'm i'm supposed to be someplace else somewhere else some other time something and sometimes you'll catch 
like glimpses or the feel of it someplace like it's funny because I can remember specific nights of feeling it where and it's always at nighttime. Yeah. Being outside and like looking at the moon and you just, okay, I feel it right now. Mm -hmm. And then it passes and it doesn't happen every time. There has to be a specific like recipe of elements, I think. Or, and even here, sometimes being out in the desert and you're just like, this is time. Like it's literally timeless. Mm Mm-hmm. This could be today. It could be a thousand years in the past. It could be a thousand years in the future. This place is exactly timeless. So it's it's weird. But how do you, I don't know how you quantify that or verbalize it or I th- write, write lyrics good enough to capture it. <clears throat> I think what, that, what a lot of that breaks down to is, um, you know, because I, I'm the same way. I used to break down and and just complete and utter convulsive tears over things like the Ziggy comics, the Ziggy movie. Do you remember the first Ziggy movie when we were kids? I remember a Ziggy movie. I oh my god, it it broke me because he was lonely. He was this lonely, dopey, uh, you know, id of of a creature that just wanted love and and like his dog runs away and it was just fucking horrifying to me and and this longing that you're talking about i've always had as well (laughs) this this you know uh trying to get to a center i think what it is that that i i mourn and i i pine for is an innocence that i never got to have I, I think that's what it really comes down to because as much as I love my family and, and I love my parents, I, I didn't have a very innocent uh, childhood. I didn't have an innocent background. There was always uh, an intensity and, and, and a darkness to it because my father was a veteran and he was, uh, <laughs> I love, I love you, dad. So if you're listening, I'm, I'm so fucking sorry, but he was a prick. He was a mean motherfucker. So I didn't get to be a little boy. Totally. I, I, I had to, I had to man the fuck up or I was, uh, the F word. That's not fuck. (laughs) You know, it's the, it's the con the connotation of a homosexual man. And, And if I showed weakness, if I showed fear, if I showed, uh, sensitivity, I was that Mm -hmm. and that wasn't because he was a bad man. It's because he was afraid. So that freaked him out. Sure. So he, he projected it on me, on my brother, Gavin, on my brother, Wayne and Gavin just so happened to be actually homosexual. So he really hammered him because we all knew when he was a little kid, Mm -hmm. you know, he was innocent. He was beautiful, little redheaded, picture me with a little bit more weight on and red hair and, and nice facial hair. Uh, I'm picturing along. young Santa. Do you remember young Santa in the yeah. one drinking and bath? Yeah. <laughs> I picture. And he's, and he's walking around in my mother's uh, not high heels, but lifts, mm. you know, pumps, and pumps. And, and, you know, it's, he's Gavin was gay since the day he was born you're born gay in my opinion and he was obviously definitely gay then and we all knew it and i just didn't give a fuck because he was my little brother and i loved him from the second i laid eyes on him but he's prancing around the house in these and the hate in my dad's eyes for him horrified me uh oh oh god you must have felt like you needed to protect him i did I did. And, and he still says to this day, you were always my protector because if my father fucked with him, I would that's my heart. thinking about my dad was my their child, like or a brother or whoever with that hate. It's because my dad knew what that meant because mm-hmm. how could you possibly be that fucked up about it unless it affected you personally? Right. Cause why would you care otherwise? Really? Gay people never bothered me. Never, never right. a day in my life because I, I've chased women since I was a baby. I've right. liked, I've 
I've adored women since I was, I've, I've been in love with women since I was two. (laughs) I've always had a crush. I always had uh, uh, this love affair in my mind of some kind of woman. Uh, He never had that, but he always had his own thing. You know, that's what Gavin was. Yeah. Uh, And that freaked my father out tool or there's just really like something profoundly fucking wrong there because how, how that could bother you about your own kid or he'd been somehow abused or you well, know no, he, he was he was as a matter of fact uh but that motherfucker is dead and good for him uh but i don't even know if it's just that i don't even know if it's just that i think there's there's like a a, a severe self-loathing that that mm-hmm. comes from because how how could it be anything but right 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 yeah like, i don't understand how first of all i don't know how people have hate for anybody they don't know let alone <laughs> somebody that close child like without there being some kind of deep-seated thing you yeah. know yeah this doesn't make logical sense and and you know to look at a child no matter what their you know what the implications are for their future self sure if they're doing something that's completely innocent how could you be angry about that right if Cain if Cain were to come to me uh you know 15 years from now 10 years from now and tell me whatever I want to be a woman I want to do this I want to do that it's I don't care I I made you I love you you're beautiful right (laughs) It's right. easy. It's so fucking easy. It is. It's not, there's nothing complicated about it. You know, and that's interesting too because people like to make, especially Christians, they like to make it this big thing of like, don't be teaching my children about homosexuality and trans and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know how like Dirk, like how I told Dirk about gay people? We were watching some show and like a dude kissed another dude and he and he just kind of like had a look on his face, not like rude, like rude or anything, but just like, well, that was different. And yeah. I was like, yeah, some dudes like other dudes and some chicks like other chicks. It's no big deal. And yeah. he's like, oh, OK. And like the whole thing with trans, too. I'm like, you know, sometimes people are born a boy, but they really feel more comfortable being a girl, vice versa. Some people just like to wear clothes or like look like a girl, but they're really a boy. You know, it was like, so like non, not an issue that I'm like, you don't have to make everything a big deal. Like it doesn't need to be a big deal. Yeah. If it doesn't affect you, a who cares, it doesn't affect you. Mm -hmm. B you make it a big deal by making it a big deal. Yeah. So Dirk is just like, okay, some guys like to dress like women or want to become a woman. Some, blah 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 who cares and it, like he'll literally say well as long as they're happy what difference does it make and i'm like thank you that's literally the point of it who well, cares well, if kid, you're happy and you're not hurting anybody kids are always the first to accept everything of course because they and don't it, have any preconceived shit drilled into them no. you know and I, I i distinctly remember being you know my dad had his issues with homosexuality but everything else no and i remember going to kindergarten and there were two young men of color who happened Mm -hmm. to sit one in front of me and one behind me because our last names were consecutive lionel smith peter tansky tommy winder it was me and these two and a kid who sat across from me leaned over and said did you see there's there's two uh he called them spooks Oh God. Did you see there's two spooks in here? And I was looking for ghosts. Right. Right. <laughs> You're like, where? I was like, there's ghosts in here. We're in kindergarten. What the fuck is going on? And and he he pointed to the two of them who were filing their way in. And I didn't understand what that meant. Right. I, I I'd never heard that other than, you know, as a ghost. And clearly he only knew that because of his dumbass parents. Because of his dumbass parents. I still know this person's name. I still know who he is. And he's really not a great person to begin sure. with, to tell you the truth. But I, I, I sincerely doubt at this point in his life he's a bigot. Um, but I'd never heard that before. And they came, they sat down. I 
immediately became lifelong friends with both of them. One of them still alive and I'm still friends with him sure. because we grew up together. We've since we're babies. Um, it didn't make any sense to me. So I came home with that and I asked questions about that. And it just so happened that the one who's uh, still alive his father and my father knew each other because uh, they'd worked together. And I, I threw that, that word out there that this kid had said to me and my father said, number one, you don't say that ever again. And mm -hmm. number two, they're just black. It doesn't, what is the, it, it's, that's nothing. That doesn't, that doesn't right. even quantify. That's, that's bullshit. Right. right. So that was all the answer I needed. But I, I was in legitimately almost an entire classroom full of people that that mattered to. Yeah. And, and that, I, I, I don't want to say it scarred me, but it left an impression. Sure. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm super happy. Like, we live someplace that's um, more diverse. You know, Dirk was in daycare with people of all different kinds of ethnicity, gay people. I mean, like, it, it's just such a non issue. And I'm I, I I like hope that there's more of that now that it is a non-issue for more kids now than it was back when we were because it was a thing back in the day. I mean, my gosh, I can remember, you know, God forbid anybody date a black person or vice versa or whatever. Like people were so up in arms about that, and it's such a nothing thing. Like. I can't even imagine that that's your thing that you get pissed off about, but people I, still freak out about it. I just hope to God it's less, at least less than it used to be. You know, I, I, I distinctly remember being 12 years old and my aunt meeting my uncle and you know, my uncle's black and that was very okay to me because uh, what the fuck did I care? Right. But there was uh, an uproar in my tiny little hometown of Avoca, Pennsylvania, because my uncle was the first black person ever in Avoca, Pennsylvania, this little Irish Catholic town mm -hmm. to the point where people were like writing shit on the house that they Crazy. lived in. And this was the, the, the fucking early nineties, man. Right. Like, right. Re like really? I mean, this is high school my friend um my best friend at the time she was dating a black guy and like mm -hmm. you would think it, it was the end of i mean her parents kicked her out of the house like it was just such a and that's so insane to me like it's so insane to me uh i think things are definitely better than they were back then you yeah. know and for most kids like my son it's not even a thing like he, it doesn't even make logical sense to him why anybody would care yeah you know and and that's good that's a good thing it shouldn't make logical sense why anybody would care because it's not logical it it it, it makes me wonder though because like my cousins who are the product of my aunt and uncle growing up biracial in the same area i'd grown up in i mean they got along okay i guess but there were definitely people who had something to say about it. Mm -hmm. And even just in passing, like with sarcastic nicknames and, mm -hmm. you know, they had to have heard it. I'm sure. I'm sure, I'm sure of it. I mean, th and it doesn't make me worry still living around here uh, because my wife and I still get looks. Yes. Yes. It makes me worry. Um, are they going to, are people going to treat my son a certain way? But I think we're at a point right now that it's like that guard of people are mm -hmm. about all day. Dying off. Yeah. yeah. They're, di they're dying off. Yeah. And Hopefully. I, I have very elderly neighbors who are way fucking cool with us. Way fucking cool with us. Yeah, you know, there, cool. There's only one set of neighborhood neighbors that are assholes, you know, but it's still a thing. It's still like, Wow, will they will people like this fuck with my kid? Ugh. And that that freaks me the fuck out, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Because, you know, racism is definitely a taught thing. Yeah. 
And those people still exist, as we can see uh, in droves voting. Mm -hmm. No need to go into that, but right. I mean, these people still exist, so it's it's definitely scary. And all and really, all you can do is just teach your your child good self esteem, and tell them there's going to be assholes in the world. Yeah, I mean. That I have, I have this thing now too, where I'm, I'm like really trying to drill consent into Kanan's head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, and sadly, I don't think I, I, I know I did with my daughter, but not to the extent I'm doing it with Kanan, where like, it sounds stupid, okay, but since he was like, you know, two and a half years old, uh, I'd be cleaning him up in the bathtub or whatever. I inform him. Like, okay, I'm going to do this now. Is that okay? I'm going to do this now. Is that okay? Yeah. To let him know that he has agency over himself. If I teach yeah. him he has agency <laughs> over himself, he'll have respect for the agency of someone else's body. Yeah. Yeah. I think you that's, know, it's, important. I think that's really good. And I mean, I even remember, you know, stuff that you don't think about when you're younger until you have your own kid about like, I'm sure you can remember being forced to give people hugs that you didn't want to give. Like, oh, go give your aunt so-and-so a hug. Yeah. Well, I'm not that person. And so when Dirk was little, like stuff like that really, you know, if he doesn't want to give somebody a hug, he does not have to give somebody a hug. So don't be like, ha like hassling him about it. Yeah. You know, that's his body. Mm -hmm. And definitely, I think that's a good thing to, to teach for their own protection, but also, like you said, for, you know, future, like, yeah, that girl doesn't have to hold your hand if she doesn't want to fucking hold your hand or exactly but, yeah. you know what I mean? like yeah. whatever. Um, I think that's super important. Coming from a family that's like deeply European too. Uh, we're lip kissers. I still am, you know, I have male <laughs> friends that I kiss on the lips. My two best friends in the world, we see each other, we kiss each other on the lips. That's what we do. You know, because one's a one's Italian. That literally horrifies me. <laughs> really, R really? Uh, that doesn't that doesn't oh even that doesn't even like register. Not, not that I think it's bad. I, I don't think it's bad. I think it's good. But like, mm. I'm so repressed. Like, no hugs. <laughs> don't tell each other you love each other. Like that was my upbringing. No hugs. Mm. No nothing. Listen, so the I thought of like kissing anybody just random no well uh -uh. i mean uh, let, let's get down to it like these two gentlemen have been in my life since i was a kid okay sure yeah even still my my dad <laughs> like, for as, as weird as my dad was we always hugged and kissed each other on the lips very polish yeah. very polish um my mom not so much my mom's repressed my mom barely hugs and kisses us uh but Da on dad's side that was a thing i grew up hugging and kissing my good friends uh my family members my siblings so you know my, yeah. my my son and i kiss each other on the lips and i drop him off at school he hugs me and kisses me on the lips it's what we do but he also knows if he doesn't want to he doesn't yeah. have to he sure. just, it's sure. just, he, he does it because I'm his dad. He loves me, but he's not going to go. I'm, I would never make him do that with anyone else. And he definitely doesn't feel compelled to do that with anyone else, except for so, his, his girlfriend at school. Yeah. Who's the TA who he loves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, I believe in affection, obviously. Like I do. I think like, I'm, I'm not saying that's weird because I think it's weird. It's weird to me because it's not how I am. Like I'm literally like hands off. Don't touch my body. Don't, you know, like that's just my own fucked upness. I mean, even the weird stuff with the supernatural shit that was very accepted, talked about and, and like, it was a thing in our house. Yeah, not I mean, it was it, like my dad and I that was that was our shit. We used to watch in search of together. He used to tell me bullshit stories about, you know, 
Sasquatch and stuff like that. Like he met Sasquatch and they got drunk together. Like he, he, he was a storyteller, but there was also a lot of real stuff. Like I have pictures of uh, the mountainside in Vietnam, like hillside, I should say. There's not really mountains in Vietnam, but there's hills. And UFOs sitting along the ridge line. Hmm. And he said, whenever there was like heavy combat, you would see them. And it was, it was just like, it was accepted. Mm. Like, okay, when this goes down, you're going to see this too. Interesting. Don't talk, don't talk about it. You know what? I feel like I just watched a documentary where they discussed this. Mm-hmm. I've seen a few. Mike and I just watched one. It might have been one of those Dr. Stephen Greer ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, where they talked about or something, I can't remember what it was now, but they were talking about Vietnam and um, secret missions and stuff. With yeah, 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 yeah. that's super fascinating. See, I, in my I, family, was uh, go ahead, sorry, no, 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 continue. <clears throat> like, with my family, everything was like, just don't mess with that, it's evil, you know, like. Yeah, there wasn't it. Nobody really talked about anything supernatural. Just like, <laughs> you're my dog. Um, yeah. You know, everything is just kind of evil. But mm -hmm. but my family is kind of like very avoidy of anything that's awkward or uncomfortable. <laughs> and so, um, I never really talked about anything like that. But like, you know, Southern Baptists, so kind of the brimstone and like i can remember going to church and be very little and you know the the, the sermons were like hell stuff you know hellfire and brimstone and so there i think there was definitely this inbred uh in you know fear of anything that was deemed evil so, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think uh, conversely, what was, I guess, great about being liberal and Catholic in the Northeast was the fact that there wasn't, I mean, we, we had a fear of God. Sure. We were definitely Catholic. We were definitely involved in the church, mm -hmm. but there wasn't as much of a, a consequence for wandering into the dark a little bit here and there mm -hmm. with with what you're watching on tv or what you're listening to it was encouraged in my house mm -hmm. mom had stephen king on the shelf dad, right dad was into watching in search of and watching like all the all the yeah. you know horror movies with me he took me to horror movies yeah in the theater we went to see evil dead 2 together yeah <laughs> Like there, he, we there was that shared interest in the macabre with both of my parents. There was that uh, they they allowed me to explore. They allowed me to have my weird old comic books, and it, it was all good because it was just in good fun. There was no quality put on it that made it evil. Mm -hmm. it, it was just innocent because you just wanted to check this out and it didn't mean you were a bad person. It just meant that you liked some darker stuff. Now talk to my mom now. And she would say, a, you were always on the dark side. And I used to call you Gomez when you were a little kid. <laughs> also, you know, maybe you shouldn't be watching that because you know, it invites things, but my mom's become far more radicalized in the church as she gets older because she's getting closer to mortality mm -hmm. and I expect that. And I, I forgive that because so what, you know, mom's, mm -hmm. mom's going to say what she's going to say. I still love my mother. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was mostly just an undiscussed thing. Like, you know, again, avoidy anything that's uncomfortable or, or weird or whatever. Don't, um, you, don't you think that that kind of pointed you in the direction of the occult? Maybe, but I don't 
don't know. I wouldn't say it pointed me in that direction. I definitely had uh, misgivings about it uh, from the start. Like, I would be there because I'm like, I'm super fascinated by all of it, right? Mm. But scared of it at the same time. So, kind of like how I like horror from films. I love, like, I want to watch them, but then at the same time, like, I've got anxiety about watching them. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, when my friends would do the Ouija board, I would never actively participate, but I would be there and, like, oh, ask it this, oh, ask it that. And then yeah. slowly you get desensitized to where you're not, like, freaked out by it anymore. And then, you know, then I would start actively being a participant in various things or whatever. But at first, like, I definitely had the, I think, Southern Baptist, like, this is evil and you shouldn't mess with it thing but i'm me and i'm also like yeah but fuck you and i'm gonna do it anyway kind of thing um you know so it's it's hard for me now this many years later because it was a long time ago i was like a teenager still yeah and so you know a, a late teenager But, like, all these years later, I sometimes try to go back and digest it again and, like, what exactly happened? And try to evaluate it from a different mindset of, like, what really happened versus what I understood to happen at the time. And I I have so many, like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's right and what's wrong and... <clears throat> what was what was real versus you know i mean i know it was all real but it's hard to explain well yeah because you exaggerate things in your mind like your memories sure. uh, so you, you do have to kind of question even even though it happened are you you know compounding it and expanding it in your own mind because there's so well, much that, hindsight yeah that and or how did I misinterpret maybe what it was versus yeah. like, and like what aspects of it are bad versus weren't bad, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to come at it from a different lens because, you know, it's like trying to view something that happened to you. It's like trying to rewrite the story. Like it's, It's difficult when you've got something ingrained in you that happened a specific way. And then in retrospect, you're like, but what if it didn't happen? Like trying to come at it from a different angle and, and, and uh, take a different look at it. Like maybe it wasn't the way I perceived it. Yeah. At the time, not that it didn't happen, but like maybe things were different as far as like what was evil versus not evil. Like, it's very, it's very confusing. I mean, I'm never going to have answers. You can't have answers to these things. But, um, you know, just certain things that were hap- that happened that were so bizarre that I thought were even bizarre at the time that I'm like, I don't understand how that happened, what happened, like why it happened, who, what, who was I talking to? Like, it's very, it's a great mystery. And I don't delve too far into it because without knowing like none of us know none of us can know what we're dealing with on the other side and so you may innocently think oh yeah i'm just doing a ouija board talking to spirit and really (laughs) you're like fucking talking to like absolute darkness or vice versa maybe you think you're talking to absolute darkness and it literally is just like we don't know that's the, that's the whole thing of it we don't know yeah so i try not to get too overly entrenched and stuff because i don't want to open doors and do all that at. it's yeah. better off sometimes just not having an answer <laughs> you know like literally I- Little known secret when men hit their 40s, bladder control goes out the window. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be an issue with chicks, too. Yeah, yeah, it's just it, it, it gets dicey, but uh, <laughs> you know, where, where we left off with the uh, 
the whole occult thing and 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 you know your perspective on it i don't know if a we're supposed to know like you'd said but also mm -hmm. i think if it felt weird then it probably wasn't very good no i know and and i yes i 100 percent agree with you on there how however i think the thing that i um i was very black and white about it good evil don't mm -hmm. mess with this you know what i mean like and now now as an adult i and like having learned more about you know lots of other things i'm like okay maybe there's varying degrees of of varying degrees of it where you know you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing like it's okay to be do to do this but steer clear of this kind of like it's it's hard to it's hard to know where that line is i guess yeah and it's kind of irrelevant because it's not like i'm over here trying to it's not an everyday part of my life so it doesn't matter but sure i, I just sometimes sit back and try to like think about things again from a new perspective and then like <clears throat> try to figure out you know what happened how you know it's just very bizarre i mean i'm never like i said i'm never going to get an answer so i don't spend a whole lot of energy thinking about it but it's it's very curious yeah i mean i go back and i think about like and these are things that were out of my control it's not like i was playing with ouija boards when i was three and sure. I had an imaginary friend and all this fucking weird shit happened in the first house we lived in, then the next one, then the one thereafter. Sure. Um, but is there, a, there's something that always like kind of occurs to me, like, is there a part of me that was maybe inviting all of this too? Hmm. Uh, is that possible? Maybe, you know, I mean, my dad had his, you know, ideas about where things stemmed from too. But we move into this house when I'm like 12 going on 13 and we're digging up a sewer line, you know, and that's all we're doing. We're just trying to dig out and it's terracotta sewer pipe, which is the original style from the 1800s. And we're putting in PVC. Yeah. I was doing plumbing work when I was that young, I was raised by a, a, a pipe fitter. <laughs> I did electrical work at that point in my life too. But we're putting all of that in and we find the mason jar that we clean off and we look through and we come to find is a fetus. Oh. And that was kind of common at sure. one point where women would have a, a midwife come in and uh, terminate a pregnancy for them and they would save whatever remnants there were. Or if there were a stillbirth somewhere along the line, they would save that too and put it in a jar and bury it in the house so they could be close to it or whatever. I, I don't understand the rationale, but we found it and it's documented. We have pictures of it and I don't ever go back to it because it's fucked up, but it was there and there was something inherently extra about this house that didn't occur at the other ones. My question is, I think to the universe, not to you or anyone else, sure. why were we in this path? Why were we put on that trajectory that put us in harm's way at every impasse? You know, what was it? What, 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 what was the thing that had kind of made our family drift constantly and in, into psychic or, or, or spiritual harm's way? I'll, I'll, I'll always wonder that, like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, I, was yeah. just, I was just a kid i didn't ask for any of it you know and another thing too is that maybe everybody is but some people just aren't aware like yeah. maybe everybody has weird stuff and but most people kind of just blow it off like i mean you know i did certainly mm -hmm. except for the really obvious thing but like yeah i don't know I was always way tuned into it, like, w like too tuned into it. Sure. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, of course the horror movie fascination was in me and the, the novelization was, was, was there. But, um, 
things that yeah. maybe a normal kid would kind of pass off as like, you know, being half in and out of a dream. I, I, I just adhered to, I, I was ultra aware of it, like laying in my bed and seeing car lights pass the house. And we didn't live on a busy street, but you know, a car would pass the house and you would see, uh, shadows or not shadows, but, but remnants of the headlights, the light coming through the curtains and, and casting upon the far wall of the bedroom as they would go by. But then eventually one was very bright going past the house and we did live by an airport, but not that close, but the lights came off the wall and started spinning above my head. They weren't on the wall anymore. They were in midair and I would just be paralyzed laying there watching it. Was it a dream? It doesn't feel like it. I, it, it's so vivid and so fresh in my mind. Sure. And that wasn't even in the bad house that was in the house before that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know. Like you know, and, and I've heard this said too that if they're always there, mm-hmm. everybody doesn't recognize that they're there. And if you do, it's almost like they turn their head towards you like, "Oh, you see me." Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's kind of like you know, because I I remember back in the day, like when we first started getting into this stuff, like people would say, "Well, if you don't believe in it, it's not going to work," mm-hmm. because even if it works, you're not going to believe in it. And like, but again, you know, maybe it is something that where there's you know something in you that they recognize you recognize them, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, and and it's it's like I do too, but I've always kind of like uh, don't look, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. don't look, or try to write it off as something else, or legit think like, oh, that was just my imagination. But then in my brain, I'm going, but that really did happen, you know. But there, know. there's so many coincidences too, like along the line, like. Let's take, for example, and it's a, it's a really cheap, it, it, it's really cheap, but I still every, every morning at 3.33 a.m. wake up, which they consider mm-hmm. the ultimate witching hour. That's why the name of my podcast's uh, publishing company is 3.33 a.m. Studios, because I wake up every morning at that time. Yeah. Regardless, regardless of what, I'm up. I'm looking around. I'm like, <laughs> Is it because I'm superstitious and my body knows? Maybe. Maybe. It's very possible. Or your your body's trained at this point. Yeah, or my body's trained at this point. But either way, why? Why? It's still weird. Why am I trained for that? Why is that a a, a thing in my subconscious? And why does my body's clock know what time it is every morning? You know, like I, I do the same thing with 222. I catch the clock at 222 an awful lot. And I see that number in random places a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe it's, maybe if I paid attention to 344 or 581, I would, you know, or something. I mean, that's not a time, but right. you, know, you get what a point, like. Maybe your brain recognizes something and then continues to recognize it. And then, but if you had focused on a different number, that would have been the number that you see all the time. But like to, to actually wake up at a specific time all the time, it's almost like, did something happen at that time in your life and it was ingrained or you're tapping into somebody else's memory of that time? Yeah. Gen- like maybe through genetics or if you believe in past life, maybe a past life or somebody's energy in the house, something happened to that to somebody. And like, so now it's kind of ingrained in you. Like who knows? Yeah. Really? But, it, but it, it, it begs the question. It, it begs the question. Why? Like, right. Because right. this had gone like, on. Why you? Why, why me is a big one. And, you know, it, they call it the mockery of the Trinity, you know, the three threes. Um, yeah. 
is that what it really is? I don't know, but I can tell you it had gone on long before I'd known about the mockery of the Trinity. Right. Sure. Long, long before I was a kid, I was, I was a child, legitimately a child. I didn't, even, I didn't even make that connection. Well, yeah, they say, you know, if a, if a being is, is at three thirty three AM knocking three times or whatever, whatever the case may be yeah. that they're mocking the Holy Trinity. Um, is that literally what... like that? Like now my brain is going to be thinking about that. Is it that, or is it just synchronicities? You know, because I see synchronicities all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. Last last year, we'd run, we have oil heat in the house, and we had run out of oil, and and the company couldn't come and deliver more until the next day. We have a small child in the house. So uh, in that case, you can run diesel fuel through your system. Your house is going to smell like diesel fuel, but it'll burn it. Uh, So I was going out to get diesel. It was freezing cold. And I'm driving down the street in a a neighborhood that I'm familiar with because one of my friends lived there right near where I had grown up. And there's a, a street light blinking, which is not weird. But as I'm driving by, there's a porch light blinking in time with the street light. They're not on the same circuit at all. It's not possible for them to be. Uh, a home circuit and a street light circuit are they're, right. they're not on the same line. Okay. So having done electric electrical work for most of my life, I know that. And I'm but I'm still seeing it. It's still happening. And it's like, not only is it happening, but I'm, I'm the one seeing it. So <laughs> what the fuck is and going on right here? You do this where you start going, is that a sign? But if it's a sign, what is the design of? Are you what? trying to work? Don't go get diesel fuel. Yeah. Or yeah. are you trying to tell me, yes, do go get diesel fuel. Like be fucking clear with your signs. Okay. <laughs> and, and it was going in fives. One, two, three, Ew. four, five. Stop. One, what the two. hell? There's no way, unless somebody was is that a worse code thing. It, it not really. I mean, if it is, I'm not familiar with it. I only know SOS and like one or two other things from the Boy Scouts. But unless someone was standing in their living room with all the lights off in the house, which all the lights were off in this house, and watching it and going in time with it, who has time to do that? Right. Who has time to do that? That doesn't make a lick of sense. Right. <laughs> You know? hmm. boom 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 and i i slowed to an almost stop just so i could look ahead and look into my periphery in the rear view mirror yeah. and see the home and the street light doing the same thing i go i get the diesel fuel my whole vehicle reeks of diesel because i have not one but three five gallon cans of diesel in the back of my suv <laughs> Yeah. And I, I'm on my way back and I slow to a crawl and I fire up my iPhone and I'm videotaping it. And you can see both the street light and the home blinking in synchronicity. So weird. What the fuck? Like I, I just I, I can't I had to I had to drink that night. I stopped for a bottle of wine on the way home. I'm like, I'm drinking tonight because this is too much for me. <laughs> I'm starting to get the creeps. That's so like <clears throat> I mean it's Halloween. It's supposed to be in the creeps, right? Yeah, and the veil the veil is lifting, as they say right now. So like uh, it's very thin between the land of the dead and the land of the living, which is why the the uh you know Irish uh druids coined San Samhain, you know, that's that's their holiday. Um but that's know. another thing that weirds me out because I keep having dreams with my dad and um, but it's weird because in the dreams, my um, it's like my dad's young and my parents are still together. Mm-hmm. And I also had a dream about Mike's stepmom that just she passed away a few years ago. Shortly, I think shortly after my dad, around the same ish time. So I'm like, okay, well, who else is gonna show up? Peter, it's about your turn because I tend not you, Peter. Um, I I tend to have dreams about him too, randomly. 
No, I don't know. I used to have I, like so many people. My my grandfather, just the one grandpa though. And when I was in school, several kids died, and I had dreams about them after they died too. And like you said, I think some of it is your brain just kind of rectifying the fact that they're gone. Did they die out? Did these kids uh, in elementary school die all at once? Uh, round about the same time. They were in high school. Well, one of them was in middle school, and they were both in accidents. One of them got ran over on his dirt bike. And the other one actually fell on a corn sifter. Oof. He worked on a farm. Yeah. When I was in elementary school, I was in third grade, I believe. Uh, there was one kid that I was really close with and three other kids that lived in a group home. Uh, they were foster kids. Uh, and the house caught on fire around Christmas and they all died. That's horrifying. And I, I knew all of them, but I was close with one. His name was Georgie. Uh, oh, that's so sad. Yeah. We, we went on Christmas break. We came back. I'm looking for him. I'm looking for Georgie. He was a cute little blonde kid, uh, like thick glasses. Very sweet. You could tell he'd been through hell. I was looking for him. And I asked, I th believe Miss Verdeen was my teacher at the time. I asked Miss Verdeen where he was, and she started crying. Oh, not heavily, but you know, yeah. She said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Peter, but your, your friend is, is not with us anymore. Uh, the oh. house, the house he lived in burned, and he and these other kids oh. ha had passed in it. Um, and I didn't cry because I didn't understand death fully yet. Sure. But I was sad that my friend wasn't around anymore. <laughs> and it, what's really weird is it hit me when I was about 13 or 14 years later that this kid that I, I loved, he was such a sweetheart, died. He was gone. <laughs> and then is when it, it like years later it hit me. But uh, there was... <laughs> There was a similar situation when I was in first grade. Uh, there was a pretty renowned mass murderer in our area. Uh, what was his name now? Uh, George Banks. He mm. worked for the department of uh, and the environmental department around here, DEP. Uh, he had a few different women, children with a few different women. And he was a Vietnam veteran and he had PTSD and he was really fucked up. And he went to the trailer park near where I still live. And after having gone and killed a, a few of his own children and their mothers mm -hmm. and stuff, he went into onto a, a tower of some kind and started picking off passersby with an M16. How did he get yeah. an M16? I, I want I don't I still don't understand, but uh he picked off two kids from my school, one of which was in my class. Uh. Because they were his kids. <laughs> I, I that's why it's weird to me. Like I, I've all I'm always in some somewhere in the path of of tragedy. I I was younger than school aged, and I was at a, a an amusement park that a family friend had owned it was called rocky Glen park uh and they had at the time the world's biggest roller coaster and they had the world's biggest roller coaster accident and i was there Good i don't I, I i really don't remember it though but i've never been able to go on a roller coaster because i have a terror of roller coasters because when i was a kid i watched a roller coaster go off the tracks into a lake because this roller coaster went over a fucking lake went, boom, right off into the lake, killed a whole bunch of people. Uh, I'm always in the path of, of a, uh, some kind of destructive energy. Are you like a harbinger? A harbinger of you? Maybe. <laughs> I hope not, but maybe. No, right? Um, at the very least, I feel like I'm kind of stuck bearing witness to something really terrible. <laughs> Yikes. Not an so observer. Much. Maybe you're an observer. Maybe. Not so much anymore, though, I, I have to say. 
uh, in my adulthood, it's it's not been quite so grim. But you know, well, even like, when I was in, my best friend in high school, his brother hung himself. You know, in the house we were in the house. <laughs> you know, he, he lived. Did. Michael lived, but he was never the same. And like they'd found him a like not too late, but a little too late. He had to relearn how to walk, talk. He was a teenager, he was 16 years old. Uh, and, you know, Michael had vivid memories of talking to his dead grandparents and all this other stuff. But he did. He had to learn how to relearn how to walk, talk, do the whole thing. And he was never the same person again. Wow. And I think the worst, and this is the last I'll talk about this because it's fucked up. But in Avoca, there was a, a, it was a bar for kids. It was a soda shop called Martha's Soda Shop. You could go in, play pool, play pinball, get like root beer floats and like frozen pizza that they would throw in the, uh, you know, toaster oven for you. It was a great place great place for us to to hang out as kids Andy, a guy named andy coffee owned it he was a great guy but right next door was a pizza a pizza shop uh and the owner's child was very young probably like five or six years old i was going to martha's soda shop and this kid comes tearing out of the front of this place the pizza place next to it onto main street and a tractor trailer hits him ah uh. And when they say people get knocked out of their shoes, he was knocked out of his shoes. And it vaporized him. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was probably 10, 11 years old. And I, I stood there and watched it all go down. <laughs> I recount these things over and over again in my head. And I, you've said to me before uh, that Mike says my life is like a movie. Or, or something, or it should be a reality show. And maybe it should, but it's, it's fucking horrible because I've seen so many great things, but so many fucking bad things. And it was all before the age of 18. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But that town I grew up in, I'm telling you, I, I wouldn't move there for all of the money in the world. I would not move back to Avoca, Pennsylvania for all of the money in the world because it is cursed. It's the name of it alone is is Gaelic for a veil of tears. They changed wow. they changed the name of the town after there was a, a, a very horrible train accident. It was called Pleasant Valley. And a whole bunch of people got killed in a train accident there and they changed the name of it. I I'll never go back there. I'll I'll go to visit just for shits because it's haunted as fuck and i know it is and i catch the feeling every time i'm there but i won't live there that's creepy yeah i won't live there and all of this stuff all of this really really whacked out shit happened in the confines of that very tiny little town of like 1800 people creepy dude mm -hmm. yeah man I don't wish this on anybody, but it's it's a weird place. <laughs> it made me who I am, though. So there's that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's good, bad, or indifferent. Well, it, it is. It just is, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's it's really no different than like what I'd explained about Ohio or you know mm -hmm. the the things that happen in uh you know the hollywood hills mm. you know like the manson murders were not the only murders in those hills mm. there were, there's so many like really dark things that occurred there even like if you go back to american indian times that was a sure. place that they avoided you know the santa ana winds bring in a lot of bad juju i guess for that area because they yeah. kind of spill into the hills and it stirs up ghosts as they say there there's there's a side of a side of life that we all actively participate in and there's a side of it that we'll talk about in secret behind closed doors to people we trust yeah the little askew of what you would call normal 
maybe it's ghosts, maybe it's not, maybe it's aliens, maybe it's this, that, or the other thing, but there is something other that is undeniable, palpable, and all encompassing that everyone avoids. And that's just, yeah. And that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> yeah, I think it's weird. Like I said, like I was just, because I knew, you know, I knew we were going to hang out for Halloween. Yeah. And so last night when I was walking, I was like, you know, there's two sides to me because on the one hand, I completely believe anything and all things are possible, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I believe that. But then on the other side, I'm like, but maybe it is just all one dimensional. You live, then you die, and that's all there is. You know? But then it, I can't, I just can't fathom that that's the case. Well, think about it like this we're basically meat robots okay we are powered by electricity and yeah. elect electricity's energy energy can neither be created nor destroyed right it, it goes on whether yeah right that energy normally doesn't leave the planet but it goes to ground that's its its nature mm -hmm. is to go to ground and to accumulate and it is born again through lightning and, and things of that nature. Um, and, and, uh, the resonance of, of certain stones and whatnot, that energy just continues and, and gets recycled and moves on and on and on. So even an atheist has to, uh, understand that your energy is never going anywhere. It has always been, and it will always be. So that being said, that energy, why couldn't it have a consciousness? Like what we believe about aliens, for example, we always picture something that's not human, but humanoid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something that has form that doesn't necessarily need to be like Neptune mm -hmm. can be completely inhabited by creatures that are silicone or energy or vapor based. Sure. There's no, there's no need for it to be anything that we can recognize because that planet to us is completely uninhabitable, but to a being that is energy or vapor based, why couldn't it? Same thing right. as Mars. Mars could be fully inhabited by beings that are energy based that you can't quantify, qualify, or photograph. Yeah. Just because yeah. they don't have buildings doesn't mean they're not there. So that being said, why couldn't we just be, vapor based energy based we're just energy anyway the the body deteriorates the energy continues on so yeah. as atheist as you want to be you, you can't get around that you can't escape it yeah this is the kind of stuff that always gets me freaked out because he has a like and then go back to when i was a little kid i would sit there and think about you know people not existing anymore like, you know, my mom, like if my mom and dad died, what would happen to me? And then, mm -hmm. then I would get in this cycle of, oh my God, someday I'm not going to exist. That's bizarre. Like, and it would freak me out even as a really little kid. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I still get freaked out about that. Like the, the, the thought that one day you are going to die, you're going to go through that process. That fucks me up. We're thinking about, especially with having a child and you're like, my kid's going to still be here. Knock on wood. Yeah. Beyond me. And he's never not had me. Mm -hmm. Like that fucks me up, you know? Sure. So like the, these things are horror to me. So I don't need to fucking watch slasher films because that shit's horror to me. Like yeah. the reality of, that time i fucking hate time i hate it since time as far back as i can remember just the evil the everything changing constantly and die essentially dying i fucking hate it and so like like literally everything i write is just there's a horror of time and i i just it's horrifying to me you i hate hear, it you want to hear something really scary I love Maybe. getting I love getting old. 
I love I love it. I love that I'm older. I love that well, I don't love that my body's breaking down because it is. Uh, but I, I love that I'm at this age, that I have a son at this age, that I'm not the person I was 20 years ago when, when my daughter was a, a little kid, uh, because I'm, I'm better. I, I was a terrible person when my daughter was born. I, I loved her. I took good care of her, but I was not a good person. I was a selfish, weak child. <laughs> well, men, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't mature the way the ladies do. You know, we, we're just, we're not built that way. We're very selfish. We're very self-involved. Uh, and I was, you know, uh, I, I could have been so much better to her mother. Her mother was not a great person, but I could have been so much better. Um, that being said, you know, this now, this, this me that I am now is the best version. I, I am the peak version of me, even though physically I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not who I was. I don't look as good. I don't, I don't move as well. I'm, I'm not as strong as I was. I'm not attracted as attractive as I was, but I'm definitely the best version because I recognize now all of the bad that I've done and everything that, that I don't like about me, I've sloughed off by now. Sure. You know, with the, with the exception of like, I, I like to, I like to have some, some wine, you know, and that's not good because I'm a, I'm an addict, but I, I do, I, I like a drink. So I'll have a couple of drinks. I'll have some conversations with people online. I'll record them and put them into the world. And that's the end of it. Um, I, I don't get angry. I don't, break the house apart. I don't do any of that craziness under the influence of, of any sort of intoxicant. I'm just kind of like, eh, I love everybody. Ah. And then I go to bed. But <laughs> if that's my vice, if that's... what's that? And wake and up at 3.33. Every morning. Yeah. But it, it's, it's but kind I mean, of, I like, uh... that, I like that part too. Like, I like the fact that I've learned from mistakes. Uh, I mean, some of them are, ongoing mm -hmm. but like i mean i like that part of getting older but i don't like the passage of time in the i like the personal evolution i don't like the everything else right of moment. like I, you know i've just learned to accept the the parts that i don't like about it for the perks of of what i do i think that's that's kind of what it is and well, we uh, have no choice in the matter no, we don't. And I've kind of given up on the idea. Maybe that that's good. another thing I hate about it is that we have no choice in the matter. <laughs> I think that's why vampires are so appealing to me because they can just continue yeah. to evolve and evolve and evolve on a, on a personal level, but they don't have to fear the fucking whatever. Yeah. They get to, they get to be the ideal version of themselves forever. Yeah. I'm not the ideal version of me. I was a, I was a pretty good looking young guy and that, that got taken away from me. A lot of stuff got taken away from me, but what I got in return far outweighs that. I don't like, I don't even care how I look anymore. It doesn't matter. I don't even, I used to like, you know, I'd be combing my hair and making sure I was, I looked tight and everything was nice and had nice clothes. And now I just wear flannels and throw on a cap and, Fuck it, whatever. Uh, but what I get in return is is this uh, magnanimity, the, this idea that I don't have to be so obsessed with the self. It's all about, you know, the people around me, my wife, my child, my mom's still alive. My mom's still alive. I'm 46 years old. My mom's still here. How fortunate is that? You know, I, I have a massive amount of siblings that I love. I'm how fortunate is that? It's incredible. I still have my best friends, the, my two best friends that are still alive. I still have. Holy shit. Yeah, it's great. It's, great. it's wonderful. I'm not broken in a gutter. It's great. <laughs> there's there's so much to be thankful for that even the things that depress me to this day, I they still depress me, but. I recognize that they don't really matter. Mm. 
and and it's just ego that bums me out and someday that'll be gone too so whatever <laughs> yeah i know it's, I, don't it's, know. I, I just don't i don't know i don't know that all just fucking freaks me out i think women have and i've said this to you before an, a really really enormous enormous amount of of uh self-consciousness that's projected upon you by the media by uh magazines by television by like this is this is the perfect this this is what you're supposed to achieve this is how you're supposed to look men we don't what we have to live up to is clint eastwood you know you have to be tough you have to be this and that's dying that's dying it's withering on the vine and it should be withering on the vine for women too and it is to a degree but not enough we have to really break that paradigm where women have to have a certain physique and this that because if we look back to michelangelo women were rubenesque they weren't these like like big breasted yet lithe uh svelte bodies it was women had serious curves there was a lot going on there that uh you know the rubenesque woman that 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 aesthetic when that was considered the height of beauty wasn't really all that long ago when you think about it so why is it so far from between michelangelo and lizzo yeah like why did why did it take so long no i don't know because of fashion because of clothes hangers they wanted women to look like clothes hangers for so long that it made you all hate yourselves. And I resent that because I, 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 I understand women to the point where it's like, no one could be that. No one could live up to that unless they have a personal trainer and a drug habit and <laughs> have an eating disorder. Time yeah. to actually spend on it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not fair and it's fucked up and it's wrong. Happy Halloween, baby. Jesus, Jesus loves you. Happy Halloween. What? What, a weird, what a weird all over the place conversation. Never would have thought I would have talked about my uterus. Well, I mean, eh, everybody uh, who's female. That's has got a horror one. story, right? I mean, that's a horror story all in a, of its own. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's where we all came from, unless you were born in a test tube. And there's sure. probably a few of us that were born in a test tube. <laughs> sure. Sure. No judgment. No, no. I'm hey, sure. I don't judge. For And for the record, if, if you were conceived in a test tube, please get in touch with us here at the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I want to know your story. No kidding. I, I want to be your friend. No kidding. <laughs> so Very with good. that. With that, I think we should wrap it because, damn. Where do you go from there? You, you can't. You can't. There's nowhere else to go, really. Unless we get abducted by aliens and then we have a whole other podcast to deal with. That'll be, a, that'll be the next episode. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, I had a blast, as I always do. And yeah. you, know I, you know I love you. And love I can't too. wait to do it again. I'll yep. talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Hello, all. This has been the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. Sawin special. She's been Tara. I've been Peter. You have been beautiful. From 3.33 a.m. Studios, this has been the book of very, very bad things. Good night. Until next time, try to enjoy the daylight.